This is the Bible with Nikki and Pippa Gumbel, Express Version, Day 159. No Shades of Grey Back in the 1960s, the band The Monkeys sang about how no one seemed to believe in absolute morals anymore. In Shades of Grey, they sang, When the world and I were young, just yesterday, life was such a simple game. It was easy then to tell right from wrong. Today, there is no black or white, only shades of grey. Now the expression shades of grey has come to be associated with the notorious and controversial books and films with that name. Many today no longer believe there is such a thing as absolute right or absolute wrong. Stark contrasts and black and white distinctions are not always easy to swallow in a society in which relativism is the order of the day. Everything is relative, a matter of degrees. As followers of Jesus, we cannot give in to these relativistic ideas. We must be open to the prophetic voice of Scripture, which often traces stark contrasts, urgent ethical choices and divergent paths in the midst of complex problems and situations. The reality of right and wrong are very clear in today's passages, and there are stark contrasts between the two. From Psalm 71 Do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. May my accusers perish in shame. May those who want to harm me be covered with scorn and disgrace. As for me, I shall always have hope. I will praise you more and more. Even when I am old and grey, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Finishing well versus perishing in shame. The only kind of grey approved of in the Bible is grey hair, which is seen as a crown of splendour attained by a righteous life. Personally, I find this increasingly encouraging. The psalmist is determined to finish well. He writes, Do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. Even when I am old and grey, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation. Your might to all who are to come. This is in stark contrast to the fate of his enemies, who he hopes will perish in shame. From the New Testament perspective, this is probably not the right way to pray for one's enemies. However, it is certainly true that some people seem to perish in shame. It's a tragic way for anyone's life to end. The psalmist contrasts himself with those who perish in shame. He writes, but as for me, he wants to continue to be close to the Lord, to the end of his life. In fact, he wants the end of his life to be even more fruitful than the beginning. He says, I will praise you more and more. Every generation has the responsibility of passing the baton to the next generation. Succession planning is a key part of finishing well. It's been said that it is important to pursue a pool and train a Timothy, be mentored by a Mary and prepare a Phoebe. Lord, help me to finish well and to declare your power to the next generation. May my mouth tell of your righteousness and proclaim your mighty acts. New Testament from Acts 4 and 5 On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Indeed, Herod, and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God 
boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself and brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Filled with the Holy Spirit versus filled by Satan. Church should never be boring. No one was ever bored in the early church. You never knew what would happen. There was such a powerful sense of God's presence. Some loved it, others were terrified. Again, we see a stark contrast. First, we see the results of being filled with the Holy Spirit. First, boldness. Peter and John were not put off by the threats made to them. Rather, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They prayed, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Second, unity. All the believers were one in heart and mind. They were all filled with the same Holy Spirit. A mark of the Spirit-filled community is unity. Third, generosity. They had a liberating attitude to their possessions. They shared everything they had. There were no needy persons among them. Those who could afford it helped support those who were in need. Fourth, power. They'd prayed, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Their prayer was answered. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Fifth grace. Much grace was upon them all. Experience of God's grace should lead to a community of grace and graciousness. By stark contrast, in the second half of today's passage, we see the results being filled by Satan. Peter used very strong language when he says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? There was no necessity for Ananias and Sapphira to give away their property or money. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? They were not criticized for a lack of generosity. Rather, the evidence that Satan had filled their hearts is not only that they lied, which could be a spontaneous act, but also they had conspired together to lie. Peter says to Ananias, You have lied to the Holy Spirit. And he says to Sapphira, How could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? This conspiracy was premeditated and prepared. God gave Peter a word of knowledge. This exposed their sin. The fear of God came upon the people. This type of fear was not a fear of human beings or a slavish fear, but rather a holy fear. They had a healthy respect for God. They knew God was not to be trifled with. This is not an easy story to read, and many of us struggle with the severity of God's judgment in the passage. Ultimately, only God knows the secrets of our hearts, and we need to trust that his judgments are fair and just. It reminds us, though, of the awesomeness of God's presence in our midst. A sense of God's presence was so great that people feared that their sin might be exposed. But this presence of God and the Holy Spirit also brought about extraordinary conversions, healings, signs and wonders. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. 
May we be a church known for its bold proclamation, unity, generosity, power and grace. Old Testament from 2 Samuel 13 No, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. Love versus hate. In this passage, we see strongly contrasting emotions. Amnon fell in love with Tamar. He says, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. David had many wives and many children. The boys would probably have been separated from the girls at the age of five or six. There would not have been a sense of belonging together that exists in a normal family today. Amnon plotted to rape Tamar who pleaded with him, don't do this wicked thing. She even offered to marry him. The law forbade marriage to a half-sister. Possibly, this was not being practiced at the time. More likely, Tamar was clutching at straws. Amnon refused to listen to her, and since he was stronger than she, he raped her. The Bible does not ignore the issue of sexual abuse. Rape has always been and still is a horrific crime. Tamar described it as wicked. It's an act of a wicked fool. It leads to desolation and it is a disgraceful act. We see a glimpse of the terrible damage sexual abuse does to the victim. Tamar poured ashes on her head. Then she ripped the long sleeve gown, held her head in her hands and walked away sobbing as she went. She became bitter and desolate. Instantly, it appears, Amnon hated her with an intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he'd loved her. This led to further tragedy for David and his household. The violence is perpetuated. Amnon is killed and Absalom flees, separating him from David. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say Amnon was infatuated with Tamar. He may have been in love with her, but he certainly did not love her. It is extraordinary, though true to fallen human nature and experience, that infatuation can quickly turn to hatred. Amnon's love was certainly not true love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Lord, deliver us from hatred. May we be filled not by a superficial love, but by a love that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Pepper adds, In 2 Samuel chapter 13, we see the family breaking down. There seems to be some terrible decisions going on at the time. Jonadab, who was Amnon's friend, gave bad advice. And if David had punished Amnon for raping his sister Tamar, it might have stopped Absalom for taking the law into his own hands. Jonadab, who clearly should have been ashamed of himself, was half the problem. He knew it was Absalom's expressed intention to kill Amnon, yet he didn't warn David. He only tells him afterwards. He was a bad friend to them all. It is hard to tell people the truth rather than to tell them what they want to hear, but it is important to give the right advice, even if we risk the friendship.